I'm Hal Moskowitz, and this is my delicious husband, John Murphy, and we are going to go on a quick walk down my memory lane. I like to say that I came out of a cast iron closet, but when the door opened, I came flying out in all of the colors of the rainbow. I came out in 1975. It was during the beginning of the sexual revolution and the gay rights movement. It was young and it was fledgling, but it was new and it was open and it was exciting. And it was home. This is ground zero for the gay world. Christopher Street, New York City. All these stores that are now reopening, closed, reopening, were all gay establishments. This is the archives building that's now luxury condos. And this is Weehawken Street. Oh my God. In the 70s and the 80s, this street from Christopher to, um, to 10th Street is, was like one huge backroom bar. As we continue on, we're heading towards 12th Street, which was where 12 West was, which is where my, my fondest memories and my gay heart lives. We would go into 12 West on Friday, and sometimes we wouldn't leave until Sunday night. Early on in that experience of home, as a healthcare professional, I started to notice certain patterns. Things like purple spots that didn't go away and night sweats that were not just perspiration or sweating during sleep, but the beds were drenched and diarrhea that wouldn't change or wouldn't stop and people were losing weight. And then people started dying and they were dying from a rare strain of hepatitis. Nobody knew what was going on. The government wasn't listening. The city wasn't helping. The medical community was not up to speed. That's how I got involved with the gay men's health crisis. The gay men's health crisis is a service agency that services all people with AIDS, and that includes infected and affected people. I was running around taking care of homebound people who were isolated in the Bronx who had HTLV-3, which is what it was known as at the time. We would get a client on a Monday, and if we didn't call them by Thursday, chances are that they would be gone already. This is where 12 West was. Where you could close your eyes and dance for hours and nobody would bother you and just travel. Some of my fondest memories have been right here. My friend Andy was the manager of 12 West, so I never had to wait online to get in. Andy got sick pretty early on in the epidemic, and when he ended up in the hospital, he called me to tell me that he had been admitted into the hospital and that he didn't know what was happening, but he was pretty frightened. And I said, I'm coming. And he said, okay. Sorry. When I got there, I started to walk into the room and somebody said, no, no, you need to put gloves and a mask on. Not the medical staff, but one of the family members. And I just turned around and I said, you can put on masks and gloves if you want. It's really not necessary unless you're gonna come into contact with bodily fluids, which I doubt very much is gonna happen. But please go into the room. That's where he is. He's not here in the hallway. And the signs for isolation are there for a medical purpose, not to keep you out of the room. When Andy died, which was not too long after, his mother asked me if I would give the eulogy at the funeral. And that was so huge, because there I was standing in front of a room full of born-again Christians as a gay man talking about my friend Andy, and nobody knew who I was or where I came from, but I know that out of that experience, John and I changed a lot of people's lives for the better. We were on this merry-go-round for 12 years. We were either on the horse, getting on the horse, getting off, getting back on again. There was always an overlap. There was one sick, one dying, one dead. One sick, one dying, one dead. And it was like that for 12 years. 
I keep this in a very sacred, safe place where nobody knows really where it is because if this ever disappeared, I would be completely devastated. But this is my phone book. <laughs> I can't, I can't do this. This is my phone book from 1975 to about 1984. Um, it just has names crossed out in it. Dates of hospital admittances and then funeral dates. And um, there are just way too many people that I can't remember their names. Um, and so I do remember them. I just choose not to go there, but they're here. in New York City. My very important role in this march today is as a human being. Last year after the Pulse Massacre, Tigger Ferguson, who is a performance artist, amassed 49 of his friends and colleagues to clad themselves in all white and march in representation of one of the victims of the Pulse Massacre. This year, we are bringing forth the spirit of those that are not here today to march with us for the rights that they were denied in their mortal life and hopefully have them wherever it is that they are. We are not ghosts, we are not spirits, we are human beings, plain and simple, equal with everybody else.